The victory at Actium leaves Octavian the undisputed master of the Roman world. Antony's memory is formally expunged. His statues are removed. It's as if he never existed. The story of Actium is transformed into a grand battle. Octavian's faithful friend, Maecenas, becomes the patron of consequential poets, notably Horace and Virgil, who will rewrite history of the battle, all the while bankrolled by Octavian. But what is Octavian's constitutional position within the Republic? Should he relinquish his newfound power? Perhaps another civil war will flare up. Should he hold on to power even more? The murder of his adoptive father, Julius Caesar, warns him to tread lightly on offending the Senate. Should he retire or remain in power? Amazingly, Octavian does both. Mr. Seeger presents The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, a cautionary tale. Episode 3, Octavian Becomes Augustus. Octavian's goal seems simple in theory, but difficult in reality. He wants to be in charge, but he has to make the Senate want him to be in charge. Octavian aims primarily at persuading the Senate that he is not heading in the same direction as Caesar. In 27 BCE, Octavian goes through the pantomime of yielding his power back to the Senate and then receiving most of it back again. In a formal speech to the Senate, he says, I lay down my office in its entirety and return to you all authority absolutely. This statement comes as a shock. When Octavian sits down, there are protests among the senators. The whole proceedings of his abdication and declaration of the restoration of the Republic are carefully stage managed so that the Senate will practically beg him to remain in power. He is given consul for life. Of course, there is always another consul and is commander-in-chief of hand-picked provinces like Egypt, Spain, Gaul, and Syria. Most significantly, the Senate officially names him Augustus, meaning sacred or revered. He considered being called Romulus, the mythic founder of Rome, but Romulus was associated with the title of king. Augustus, on the other hand, has a nice religious flavor to it, suggesting that he is more than human. Therefore, from this point forward in our videos, Octavian will be referred to as Augustus. Augustus does not want to be known as a king or even emperor. He prefers to be called princeps, meaning first citizen. This is why historians call the reign of emperors a principate. In 23 BCE, Augustus falls so seriously ill that he decides to alter his constitutional position. He gives up the position of consul for life after having a record total of 11 consulships. In its place, the Senate rewards him with the position of plebeian tribune for life, allowing him to convene the Senate, to propose laws in the assembly and to veto anything. Meanwhile, his military authority is strengthened in the empire as the Senate makes him in charge of all provincial governors. Augustus handles the Senate with firmness, but with respect. He always refuses the gifts of the Senate at first until they practically beg him to take powers. By 19 BCE, he agrees to accept not the consulship, but consular power. Therefore, his authority becomes equal to that of the consuls without the day-to-day -day tasks associated with the job. A brilliant innovation, it means that on a day-to-day -day basis, it appears as if everything is business as usual in the Roman Republic. The people continue to elect their officials as they have done for centuries, and those officials exercise power and seem to run the government. Yet, lurking behind this superficially republican system is Augustus. And if anything ever happens that he does not like, he can pop up and exercise one of his many powers to arrange matters to his satisfaction. No one ever formally proclaims Augustus emperor, though we tend to call him Rome's first emperor. Although he seems to have grown into an emperor by slow degrees in the years that follow, there is no question now as to whose word is law in Rome. Very few at the time would suggest that the Republic did not exist anymore. All of the old Republican elected offices still endure. But Augustus tends to select the candidates. And all officers should consult Augustus before any major political decision. Some old-school Republicans mourn the death of liberty but most recognize the stability and promise of fair and effective public administration. The army is the foundation of Augustus's true power. He himself is no great military leader, not even a fraction of Julius Caesar's talent. Augustus has the good sense to recognize this fact. 
Therefore, he relies heavily on his faithful friend, Marcus Agrippa, to win his military battles in his name. Nevertheless, Augustus creates a permanent army stationed throughout the empire in order to protect the borders and to keep certain rebellious provinces in control. The number of Roman legions from the civil war is over 50. Augustus cuts this number down to 28 by retiring veterans throughout the empire. By the end of his principate, there will be 25 legions in the Roman world. He discharges hundreds of thousands of veterans, most of whom are awarded grants of land and settle as farmers in a series of colonies that he establishes all over the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the army is less of a drain on the economy as the civilian veterans contribute to the empire's economy. They further Romanize the foreign territories that Rome has conquered. For his own personal protection, Augustus establishes the Praetorian Guard. The 9,000 Praetorians are stationed in and around Rome. These elite soldiers receive three times more pay than the average legionary. Fierce barbarians on the other side of the boundaries present the most problems. Augustus pushes the empire to the Danube River. The province of Germany, east of the Rhine, is made in 15 BCE. But a generation later, Germany, east of the Rhine, will be free again because of one of the worst military disasters in Roman history. In 9 CE, Augustus appoints as governor of Germany a man named Varus. When Varus treats the Germans as slaves, the Germans revolt from Roman rule. One day, Varus is leading his three legions through the Teutoburg forest of Germany. Suddenly, German warriors surround him and cut his army to pieces. The legionary standards are lost. Varus kills himself out of shame. Roman prisoners are brutally tortured. This event is Augustus's only military disaster. He will shout out from time to time in his palace, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. One of the few times in his stoic life that Augustus loses his composure. At this point, Augustus decides that the Rhine is the farthest Rome should ever go. Now, there are only 25 legions in the empire, a number that remains for a long time. For the past century, it seems that the Romans have forgotten their gods and their morals. So Augustus wants to lead people back to living the pure, simple life like their ancestors did. Thus, Augustus will restore many ancient ceremonies of worship and bring back virtuous family values. In 17 BCE, Augustus initiates legislation rewarding large families and punishing adulterers. Adultery is made a criminal offense, though only for women. A husband must reveal his wife's infidelity and then prosecute her. If he fails to do so, then he himself can be prosecuted. Yet, any outsider can report adulteries. Thus, the law produces an exorbitant amount of informers. Augustus also encourages marriage, rewarding those who have lots of children in order to restore the upper-class families that have been depleted by the century of civil wars. These reforms seem to be laughable to many of his day, but Augustus means business when he banishes from Roma even his only daughter, Julia. In 2 BC, for her presumed affairs with many prominent men, he sends her to a tiny island with no men in sight. Augustus also banishes his own poet, Ovid, to the Black Sea because of best-selling book on the art of love. Additionally, Ovid may have had knowledge of a scandal involving the emperor's daughter, Julia. Ovid never gives up hope of returning to Rome, but his requests to Augustus are unsuccessful. He dies in exile. Augustus wants everybody to know that he is bringing a brand new peaceful era, not only through the propaganda of his literary circle, managed by his faithful friend, Messinus, but also through rebuilding and beautifying the city of Rome. His other faithful friend, Agrippa, has an eye for architectural design and assists Augustus in public works projects throughout the capital. Augustus will say, I found Rome a city of brick. I left it a city of marble. After so many decades of civil war, a return to order comes as a huge relief for the people living under Roman authority. Though he himself caused so much of the trouble, is mostly forgotten. What matters is that he is now presiding over peace. Augustus establishes the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, which will continue in the empire for the next two centuries. Augustus's success as a benevolent despot is shown by the fact that there is only one serious conspiracy to assassinate him 
in his 45 years as emperor. Augustus dies on 19th of August, the month renamed in his honor, in the year 14th CE at the age of 76. The Senate deifies Augustus as a god when his spirit is seen ascending through the flames of the funeral pyre. In our next episode, we will examine the dynastic succession of Augustus, the mysterious deaths in Augustus's family, and the last man standing to become the second emperor of Rome.